welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Will you join me? Stand to your feet. Lord. Father, here's our hearts. And we come to you in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Father, let it be known this night that we have not come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman. We have not come in to hear from a black man or a white man or a brown man, tall man, short man, old man, young man. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, welcome. Touch us and heal us and strengthen us. Encourage us and guide us and guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise. The glory and all the honor goes to you. Now, Lord, while we're praying and asking you to bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers, there are sisters. We never at any time think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And so, God, we give you the praise and glory and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for the anointing that we need to hear as well as to deliver. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. As I mentioned to you, this is part number four of the marriage series. I don't even know if, if that's what they call it, how to have a great marriage, part four. If you'll go with me to Ephesians, we're, we've, we've made some statements in the first three understandings that we got together and reviewed that you might want to, if you haven't heard them, you might want to just get them. If you don't have the money to buy the CD, then we'll give it to you free. We don't care. And uh, we just love you a lot, and we think the Word of God is very important. And I made a statement the first time we were together. If you want a great marriage, you've got to go to the author of the marriage. Amen. Author of marriage is very important. If you want to, remember I said if you want a hamburger, you want to go get a good hamburger, go to In-N-Out Burger. By the way, I heard our restaurant down here puts out a better hamburger than In-N-Out Burger. A little plug there for the Rock Church. But uh, if you haven't gotten one of those, you need to go get one of those. But if you want a good hamburger, you need to, you know, go to a place that makes hamburger. You want a good marriage. You know, you shouldn't go to the world. You shouldn't go to your relatives. You shouldn't go to any place except find out what God says about marriage. He's the author of marriage. He's a creator of marriage. And he makes it very clear that it's important for you to have a great marriage. There's nothing better than a good marriage, nothing worse than a bad marriage. And we've probably, all of us, have experienced both, both portions of that. I really believe that Deborah and I are together and love each other as we do, loving each other more today than we did 35 years ago, four kids and 12 grandchildren later. And I believe that we love each other more today because of the Word of God. There's no doubt about it. We don't love each other because we're so compatible. We're probably two peas in a pod that, that explode about each other, you know, when we get together. We both have strong idea, ideas and both have strong opinions. And, you know, I found out that if two people like us can make marriage work and be happy at the marriage, then guess what? How much more is there for you guys that, that are, are, are really, really, really compatible? Deborah and I are compatible because we put the Word of God to work. We're not compatible because the nature of the person, the male or female, is compatible with the opposite sex. We are compatible because we simply found out what God said. As a pastor in early in my 30s, uh, every day I would counsel about marriages. I knew the eight commandments to the husband and four commandments to the wife, and every day I had to talk to somebody about those eight and those four. When I went home, there was no excuse not to know what to do. <laughs> and the same with Deborah. She also was the same way. And we lived 
what we preached. And today, the fruit of that is great kids, great marriage, great grandkids. Um, I mean, can I just say this to you that you'll understand? Proof's in the pudding. And that's really what you should be looking for is examples. It's not easy at times because it means you're going to have to set yourself aside. Let me say it again. It's not easy at times because you're going to have to set yourself aside and do what God wants instead of what you think or what you want. That is one of the most difficult things that anybody, even as a Christian, you need truly the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And if you rely on your own power to do it, it won't work. You'll blow up. It's just not going to happen. But the power that's on the inside of you helps you to accomplish everything you need to do. That's the grace of God. I want to read you out of these verses because they're so powerful. They give us such an understanding and give us a foundation of understanding the eight commandments to the husband and the four commandments to the wife. By the way, most Christians have no idea what they are. They know what one half of one of them is. Wives, submit yourself to your husband. They don't even understand the other half of that verse. Most people know that verse because the wife has been drilled on it. And the, most people don't know anything more than that. And then they wonder why their marriage is stink. And they really, you know, and they're asking God and begging God for help and change my husband, change my wife. Oh, God, get rid of her. <laughs> but she's not going to do. You know, and they pray these silly prayers. The 21st verse of Ephesians 5th chapter, I'm going to read it to you. Submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. Without a great reverence of God, you're going to think more highly of yourself than you are of God. Bottom line, let me say it again. If you can just get this picture for the rest of your life about what it's going to take for you and I to be followers of the Word of God, I've got to respect and want God more than I respect and want myself. A lot of times, that's not it. A lot of times, I find my fear level with God as being very low instead of very high. Some people have a big God. Some people have a little God. God is still God. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But yet some people have a big God. Their reverence level, their fear level is enormous about God. They wouldn't dare cross the line. They think too much of God. Other people have a little God and play him like a puppet on a string, and a dog in the backyard. And until you get to the place where your fear level about who God is is greater than your own personal feelings, I don't think you'll ever on any situation flow like you need to as a Christian. He goes on to say, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as the Lord. Deborah's going to cover that probably next week. For the husband is the head of the wife. Remember last time we were together, we talked about how wonderful it is to understand that the, the commandment number one was that husbands be the head of the wife. And the head of the wife is like, if you will, a spiritual leader inside the house. Not just somebody who rules and is a dictator and is out for his own personal gains and out for his own thing in life, but somebody who is a spiritual leader. Someone who grabs everybody and brings them back to the reality of what God says. Not just the reality of what people want. And that spiritual leader has got to be... In every house, in every situation, there's order. Where there's God, there's order. And whether you like it or not, ladies, let me tell you something. You have a job to play that men cannot do. And men have a job to do that women cannot do. And when a woman does what the man's supposed to do and the man does what the woman does, you now have American society total mess up. And so we need to stay in the order of God and sometimes you know we've been so indoctrinated by the economics and the social conditions of our life and of our country and of our, uh, our the population that we find ourselves making decisions based on what other people say instead of what God says. And the husband is to be the spiritual leader like a pastor is a church that a husband is to be the spiritual leader in most Christian American homes 
we find that the wife is the spiritual leader over the husband. And we find that because, and it's so sad, isn't it? It's sad because she has a reverence, a fear of God, oftentimes more than the male. And the man of the house needs to be the man of the house who protects and nurtures, guides and guards his family, and his wife, and his marriage, not letting anything come in. Sometimes, you know, when Deborah and I will have a fight or something like that, I'll go get alone and realize, man, this is, this is the devil. And then I take authority. And you know, sometimes until I take authority, spiritually, I'm talking about spiritual authority over demonic activity that wants to divide us, man, I find myself absolutely uh, in a frustrated fight instead of in a time of reconciliation. Because I haven't really taken the authority as a leader of the house. I don't want to go what we taught already. We've already taught that. So let's read past that if we can. Husbands be the head of the wife, verse number 23, as Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as Christ is subject to Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Deborah will cover that. So important. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Wow. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife also loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined, shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects, or the word there is reverence, her husband. Now, I'm going to take you back to verse number 25. This is a great verse. I'm going to read it to you again. Then I'm going to ask you a question, which you can answer out loud. So get ready to answer a wild question. Verse number 25 says this. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Can you tell me the most important word outside of the word Christ in that verse? What was it? No. no. See the word give or gave? That's what that verse is all about. Love is just a product of you giving. It's the way you love by giving. In fact, I wish I had highlighted I don't know if you're back there or not, John or Monica, whoever you are, but um, uh, see the word gave himself. To me, I find that the most important word of the entire verse. Because in, inter- in order for anything to work right, and this we- whether it's your business, whether it's your children, raising your kids, whatever it might possibly be, this has got to be the center of what you're all about. And we find oftentimes that we're not there. And can you imagine if we had a church that just simply had this kind of a heart? You know what he's talking about when he says gave himself? He's talking about how Jesus went to the cross. He says the example of a husband loving his wife is how Jesus went to the cross and gave himself. How did he do that? Sacrificially. How did he do that? He gave himself sacrificially. Sacrificially means I give up what I think, I give up what I want, I give up my desire, I give up my plan for you. And that's sacrifice. 
Sacrifice is a funny little word. It's all through the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. They used to remember how we talked about burnt offerings and sacrifices to God. and They were burnt to the place. A burnt offering was something that was brought down to dust, like a cremation process of something important. And you would bring something important to God, like a lamb or sheep. Can you imagine bringing a lamb or sheep? It doesn't mean much to you today. You know, what's a lamb? 150 bucks, 200 bucks, you'd probably buy a lamb. It's not a big deal, but in those days, it was life. And somebody who brought a lamb or a sheep, that was their life. If you had one, you were an average person. If you had two or three or four, you were upper echelon. And in order for you to bring something to, as an offering, doesn't matter who you were, that's something that was so important that represented who you were, represented your idea, uh, I, uh, your identity, represented uh, your uh, position in life, represented your status. And you take that which is so important to you and you offer it to God and you give it up for the things of God. That was called sacrifice. A lot of people say in the New Testament, well, you know, Jesus himself said something. He says, I don't want sacrifice. I'm looking for mercy. He didn't say don't sacrifice, but what he's saying is I'm looking for something. And if you study the word mercy, the word mercy is a deeper sacrifice than shallow sacrifice. He's actually asking for more when it comes to mercy because mercy says, I deserve this. I should have this. I have the right. I have the, uh, the position. I have the identity. I can do this. It belongs to me, but I'm going to give it back to you to help you. That's mercy. In other words, it's sacrifice in a deeper manner. So when Jesus makes the statement, uh, I, I, I'm not looking here on this planet for, for, for a sacrifice. I'm looking for mercy. He's actually telling us, don't stop sacrificing because you're going to have to give up what you want, what you think, what you feel, your identity, the things that you uh, represent you and give it up for somebody else. And that's what Jesus did when he went to the cross and that's how a husband is to love a wife. Can I just say this to you? Is there any wife stupid enough in this place that wouldn't absolutely respect and reverence their husband if they were loved sacrificially like that. They'd give that man anything, everything they could and praise God for him. And a lot of times we don't see that, my friends, and it's a sad thing, but sacrifice is really giving up something that you believe you have that's important to you, that you identify with, that you want, that you think you should have, and you give it up that right, that thing, in order to benefit someone else. And that's called sacrifice. And that's what Jesus did when he went to the cross and died. It was a sacrificial lamb that paid the price for your sins and mine. Here's the church. You know what they were doing at the time when he went to the cross? Number one, they were ignoring him. Number two, they were with the crowd going, crucify him, crucify him. The very same people that were yelling, crucify him, is the same people he went to the cross and died for. So he took in the middle of the abuse, still gave the sacrifice. Isn't that cool? Wasn't like people were cheering him. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you so much. They just beat the snot out of him. And we have an idea in our minds that we would, you know, sacrifice if you appreciate my sacrifice. Sacrifice if you recognize I'm sacrificing. Sacrifice, I appreciate it because I see it. And, uh, you know, that's cool. And, if, and if, you, if you acknowledge my sacrifice, then I can keep on sacrificing. There's nobody acknowledging the sacrifice of Christ when he went to that cross. In other words, he died for a church that was yelling at him at the time. And then finally they came to their senses and realized who he was and got saved. And sometimes we need to sacrifice even when the people we're sacrificing for don't treat us very good. Sometimes we need to sacrifice, and that's the best kind of a sacrifice, when somebody you're sacrificing for does not deserve it but you give anyway, sacrificially. That's an amazing love. And if God can bring that to us, and you say, well, Pastor, I'm not sure I can do that. Yes, you can, if you rely on the Holy Spirit. 
You're relying on your own ability, you can't do anything. You know, except bicker back and forth, talk back and forth, mouth back and forth. And there's this combative attitude all the time instead of shut up and sacrifice. Don't try to get the last word in. I never get the last word in. I just wait until she leaves the room and then I get a lot of words in. Does any man know what I'm talking about? And then what do we do? We repent because those were high school words. <laughs> I want to share with you some things, if I may. A satanic principle is opposite of sacrifice. A satanic principle found in Lucifer when he was in the heavens was that he wanted to exalt himself and thought of himself more than he should have. And he wanted to take the place without God. He wanted to take God's place without God. And that in itself, if you will, is the original sin, which was selfishness. Without sacrifice. And here we find oftentimes that we allow satanic principles, a principle of the devil, to come in and manage and take care of our marriages because we don't operate in the very spirit of Christ, which is sacrifice. The very sacrifice, remember how we define love in this church, we define love as, as personal self-sacrifice for the betterment of someone else. It isn't just huggy bear and kissy face and roses and kindness. It's more than that. It's giving of yourself when you don't want to give it. It's getting off of yourself and your selfishness. Because as long as you're selfish, you'll never sacrifice. Never. And can you imagine if we had a church that was ready to sacrifice? I mean, we have a lot of people in this church, and a, there's a great handful of people who are willing to sacrifice anything. But most people that come to church, our church or any American church, are more interested in themselves than they are in sacrifice. So they sacrifice for someone else. And a lot of times that stems right back to the garden where you'll find Adam and Eve. They're in a place, and she's making decisions, and they're in fear, and they're insecure. And so after that, all of a sudden, the sacrifices go. We can't sacrifice. We need to keep it for ourselves. This is not about God. It's about me, preservation. I don't know how I'm going to make it. When in fact, God will take care of you every time. If he can drop manna from heaven and take care of the children of Israel, he can take care of you. Oh, I'm going way too long already. Things that hinder self-sacrifice. Can I give you four quick ones? I don't know if I can do them quick. I'll do the best I can. In the next 10 or 15 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Things that hinder. I, f I thought about it like this. I kind of like lately to do this. I like to see the negative so I could see the correct. Because I, I operate oftentimes in the negative more than I do the correct. So do you or we would be talking about the correct right now. We wouldn't even need to be on this subject. We're on this subject because guess what? Oftentimes, we are doing the negative on, in our life. So let's do that. Let's find out what hinders self-sacrifice. Can I show you scripturally? I want to take you, if I may, to number one. Improper vision of self. Man, you think you got it, or you deserve it, or you've earned it, or you made it clear in the beginning and this is the way it is and what you want and you just think about yourself too much. When you think about yourself too much, it's impossible for you to ever be sacrificial because your whole life rotates around you. There's a story, if you will, in 2 Samuel, the 15th chapter. It's about David and his son Absalom. David and his son Absalom were amazing to me because I've studied David so much over my life. The son Absalom was someone whom David loved more than David loved himself. 
David had already lost a son that tore him up, and he hated every moment of the death of his other son. And he just loved Absalom. Absalom grew up to be a brat, into himself completely. Here's David. He's the king of Israel. He's the greatest king that Israel has ever known. Why, he's doubled the commerce of Israel. He's doubled the population. He's doubled the land. Everybody in Israel is prospering because of the decisions of this great king, David. And here comes his snotty little arrogant son, Absalom. That's his name. And he's making a statement about himself, which, by the way, ended up him dying severely, which was sad to David. Again, God had to come and intervene and tell him, look, you stop. Boy was on the wrong track. If you'll go with me to 2 Samuel, find 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, uh, 1 2 Kings, right behind 1 2 Kings, 2 Samuel. Let's go there. Second Samuel, when you get there, look at the 15th chapter, and I'm, I'm just going to read some things to you so that you can get a picture of this. Verse number one. After this happened, that Absalom provided himself with chariots. Notice the word, and I should have highlighted it, the word himself. It tells you a lot. He's not about to give anything up. He's not about to sacrifice for his great father or for Israel. Here's this young man who's providing from the inheritance that he has and from the wealth of this country chariots for himself. With chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom, verse number two, would rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. So he'd be there early in the morning. So it was that when people came in for a lawsuit, they came to the king for a decision. And Absalom would call out and say to them, hey, listen, did you know there's, I'm going to translate this for you, there's no voice there. The king doesn't care about you. And then he goes down to verse number four. Moreover, Absalom would say, here's what he's saying to all the people that are coming in. Listen to this guy. And his father is one of the greatest kings Israel's ever known, and he's bad-mouthing his father, and he's lifting himself up. His father is in the position that he wants, and he comes and he takes it from his father. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, verse number four, that I were made judge in the land, and Everyone who had a, any suit or case could come to me and then I would give them justice. Like his father wasn't just. How does somebody do that? How does somebody violate the trust of someone that loves them? Because they're thinking more of themselves than they think of others. And especially in our case, the wife or the husband. Sacrifice, by the way, ladies, doesn't stop with just men. It stops with the women, too. It's all of us that are in this thing. If we're going to express the love of Christ, we're going to have to be people that all realize this is not just the responsibility of a man to love his wife like Christ loved the church. That is the responsibility, but the wife also has to be sacrificial, too, or it won't work. Improper vision of oneself shows that you think more of your value than you would think of someone else. And remember what we talked about before, where there's contention, there'll always be pride. Things that hinder self-sacrifice. Number two, improper vision of your position. Who you are, not just Improper vision, if you will, like number one of yourself, but who you are, the position you hold. We get real arrogant about who we are. If we're the breadwinner of the house, we're now dictatorial and demanding of the things that we have. The wife, we men have a tendency to believe 
Somehow, and it's been a joke for years, we all laugh about it, but deep down inside of a man, we still think going to work outside the house, bringing home the bacon while the wife takes care of the kids is not as difficult. They don't have the job as tough as us until you get that assignment one day when she leaves and goes visit her mama. Then you realize, my God, how long do you have to be with your mama? Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Do I have any grunts in here that know what I'm talking about? Thank you, Ben. We have to watch ourselves in the positions that we're in. Jesus is talking in the Last Supper about being, if you will, someone coming along like Judas and taking advantage of his love. And he's explaining it to his disciples. Go with me to Luke in the 22nd chapter. And as he's explaining it to his disciples, they start to argue among each other about who's going to be the greatest. Can you imagine that? Jesus has to stop them. Verse 24, 22nd chapter of Luke says it like this. Now, there was also disciples, there were also disputes among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. I mean, here's a sacrificial act ready to take place, and they're in to their position. And oftentimes, it'll hinder our sacrifice because we think too highly of ourselves. The third thing that I want to share with you tonight that God gave me of things that hinder self-sacrifice is this. Improper vision of the family. Can I just say this to you? I think you should love your kids. I think you should love your wife. I think you should put your family first, but never ahead of God. There is a family order. If you want to know what it is in the Bible, I'll share it with you. It's God first. Very important for us. Because he is number one on everything. The wife is second are the husband. The children are third. And your job or your position is down there at number four. And sometimes we take number four and make it number one. Or we'll take number two and make it number one. And oftentimes what we do is we do everything for our kids not really realize that what we're doing is everything wrong for our kids, especially this generation. I remember being at a spot in my life. As a pastor, as a young pastor, I was being watched by the church on how I handled my children. I knew as well as anybody that, man, I tell you what, if you can't handle your children, you can't handle the church, the Bible says. And I knew that if my children were so off, out of balance, that it would reflect back on our ability to minister to the church. I had to take a stand. And the stand that I was going to take wasn't for my children. The stand that I was going to take wasn't for my ego. I took a stand for God. I said these words, I remember saying them. If I lose my children because I love and serve God, then I much rather lose my children then lose my God. And that's the way it's always been. My children have no problem. My grandchildren have no problem about who's in line first. It's God. And sometimes the family wants things, wants to do things. They want to do the soccer things on church days. They want to do all the volleyball games. The wife wants to go visit this wife. But if you're really the head of the house, like we're supposed to be, then in order for that to happen, we're going to have to sacrifice. And I'm going for God. I'm not going for the pleasure. I'm not going for whatever it is. I'm going to go for God. And if I lose my kids because I went for God, then so be it. Because I want God more than I want my kids. Now, there's people in the Bible, you remember like Eli, the head priest, high priest of Israel, who went for his kids more than he went for God. Do you remember that? And Eli allowed his kids to sin inside the temple. 
They took over. They brought prostitutes into the temple. They were ransacking and taking money out, just stealing. And here was Eli, and he loved his kids so much that he just let them get away with it. Did you know when he let them get away with it, he became as guilty as them. And when God's justice came, it not only, listen to this, killed every male child in his bloodline. They fell off, he fell off the wall, Eli, broke his neck, and the wife of one of his sons that was pregnant with a male son, he, she had aborted at the all at the same time. The entire bloodline was cut off because someone said, my family's more important than doing what God wants me to do is more important. And that's an eye-opening and shocking statement. And in this world today, you won't hear very many people say, and can I say something? Congratulations to you for letting me say it. Most people get up and get all huffy about it and say, well, my family's more important. Well, go serve your family. See if they get you into heaven. Because this is about what you do with Christ, not just your kids. What you do with Christ while you're here on this planet. And a lot of times we don't see that. There's this interesting story in Matthew, the 20th chapter, about the mother of Zebedee, the sons. She comes to Jesus. Why don't you turn there in Matthew, the 20th chapter. And she asks Jesus the craziest question. Man, I tell you, these are things that'll hinder self-sacrifice. You've got your importance on something else other than God. You will truly give up God for what's important in your life. If you will, in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verse number 21, she says to Jesus, and he said to her, verse 21, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. That's a pretty reasonable request from a mom. Oftentimes, our kids are reflections of our own egos. When our kids are successful, we brag and feel good about that. But there's no success outside of a relationship with God. They could be the richest, most successful business people on the planet, be in the all-stars of every money magazine, and find themselves writing articles for whatever newspaper, being one of the leaders of the nation, and still die and go to hell, and you as a parent have failed. And that would be shocking and horrible. You as a parent are responsible to make sure that your love stays in line with what's real. And what's real is not the kids want. What's real is you're going to have to sacrifice that your desire to give to those kids all the time and make their life. But sometimes you're going to have to come in and discipline them and keep them from things. You're going to have to do things you don't want to do so that your family doesn't dictate to you how you serve God. Is anybody listening? Very important. I wouldn't put up with it in my house. I had to make some decisions. My daughter was 17 years old. She's now Pastor Jessica. You've heard her preach. Married to Pastor Dan. Totally and completely turned on. When she was 17 and threw her out of the house. I mean, I threw her out. I said, get out. And I'm thinking to myself, where is she going to go? You know, get out of my house. You don't serve. I threw her out. You say, boy, you're tough. I am tough. Today she serves God and so does her kids. Married to a godly man, raising her heart and hands to the Lord. And I'm telling you, because listen, we're going to have to, in order to not let anything hinder us, we're going to have to realize that some of the things that we love and place importance on aren't anywhere near as much love or importance as the things of God. And you'll never sacrifice as long as you have other things that are more important in His place. Are we following each other tonight? We're talking about things that hinder self-sacrifice. Number four, an improper vision of your words. It's funny that we would have such a statement, but what comes out of our mouth defines who we are, where we're at, and what we're doing. Sometimes it's better for people just to shut up. You might say to yourself, well, we don't use that word shut up in my house. Well, guess what? We do in this house. 
And you know what I'm saying? There's a time when you just need to shut up and watch your words. And until you start to control what comes out of your mouth, you will always be immature with God. And sometimes the most violent things in the world need to come out, want to come out, desire to come out. It's rightful to come out. It's justified. I have a reason for saying what I'm saying. And you destroy each other with your tongue. And you need to just shut up. Men and women. Women, you have a hard time shutting up. It's the time for you to shut up. Let us get this peaceful, get back to God, and then let's come together and pray, and, and then let's discuss it. If it gets heated again, shut up. Nobody likes to shut up. They want to keep talking until we work this out. We can work it out with five knuckles across your jaw in a minute. Let's just shut up here. I absolutely don't know where that came from, but it probably wasn't God. <laughs> Improper vision of our words. I like what it says. James, the half-brother of Jesus, the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, made this statement in James, the first chapter, which you will find right behind Hebrews. Verse number 26 of the first chapter says this word. If anyone among you thinks he is religious... In other words, if you think you're a godly person, watch these words, <laughs> it's crazy, and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. The mouth says a lot about where you're at. And sometimes we have a tendency to let it out. I called the wrong number yesterday and an 805 number returning someone's call. The woman on the other end of the phone called me an a-hole for calling the wrong number <laughs> and slammed the phone down. I thought, I ought to call that number back and give it. <laughs> <laughs> then God had to get a hold of me, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to go up there and bust her up. I mean, just, I mean, just sometimes the mouth just starts fires, according to the book of James. And a little fire turns into a forest fire. Have you ever been there? It started off with a little, yeah, 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 yeah. Before you know it, you got the veins popping out, your eyes are popping out, you're cussing, you're lifting up that middle finger as they walk away. You know what I'm talking about. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We gotta learn to control the mouth because the mouth defines your future and defines where they're at. And until you control your mouth, you're never gonna be someone who sacrifices because it goes back to number one, you're too into yourself. I'll throw up a fun little verse for you, the last one for tonight, I quit. Galatians 6, chapter, verse 3. It says this. For if anyone thinks, I should have highlighted the word thinks. Because it's never anything but thinking anyway. And can I tell you something about being cool? Nobody cares <laughs> that you're cool. I mean, it took me 60 years of my life to realize that nobody looks but Debbie. 68 years to realize that she stopped looking. <laughs> Nobody cares, you know what I'm saying? I mean, those screwball people in Hollywood that make up all the movies and all this stuff that, oh, she did this, she did that, she did this, she's over here, she did this, you know, the pictures of their tongue hanging out and people like that. It's like nutty people. Why would we want to base our life on that? But it's all about thinking. How do you think about yourself? says whether or not you can sacrifice. Sacrifice is giving up something you want for yourself and feel you need in order to benefit someone else. Even though oftentimes mercy is involved, they don't deserve it. If anyone thinks himself to be something, <laughs> when he is nothing, imagine how little we are before God. 
nothing. See, sometimes in order for us to sacrifice, we have to come to a realization that bottom line, we're nothing and God came into our life and made us something. We're now king's kids, more than conquerors, overcomers. Greater is he that's in me, the Holy Spirit, than he that's in the world, the devil. My goodness, I have a future, I have a hope, but it's all in Christ, it's not in me, so I'm a nothing. But I am something in him because he's everything. That's the difference. He says, he deceives himself. You will never sacrifice anything as long as you're on the throne of your life. Let me say it again. You will never sacrifice anything as long as the world rotates around you, your feelings, and your needs. You will never sacrifice anything as long as you remain insecure about who you are and you have to gather everything to make yourself feel comfortable. This is not about you. It's about God. And if you want a Christian marriage that works, doesn't mean you won't have problems, doesn't mean you won't fight, doesn't mean you won't complain, doesn't mean you won't, you know, do things, but you're always more in love. I'm more in love with the, the woman than I've ever been in my entire life. I adore her. I don't just love her. My love for her after 35 years of marriage has gotten greater and stronger. Because, listen, guys, I learned this. There's times to give in, give up, make sure they have it. Honey, is there anything I can do for you today? I have plans, but those aren't as important as your plans. What would you like me to do? Well, someone needs to clean the kitchen. We're in a hurry. Oh, God, why did I ask that for? <laughs> but, I, but I'll go do it, you know what I mean? You know? Take the dog outside. Oh, I'll kick the dog outside. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, but you got to ask. you got to do it. And that's what makes marriage wonderful. If you'll love your wife as Christ loved the church, what wife wouldn't want to love you back? In fact, she'll love you back the right way. And you know what that is? Reverence and respect. Because men don't want love. We want to be respected. Deborah sees me as her hero man. I'm her hero man. I ought to get some pajamas. Somebody bought me pajamas one time and said hero man on them. I never wore them. I thought that was a little freaky. And so, uh, <laughs> I mean, somebody did that. I don't know who it was, but anyway, it's just the way it is, guys. She loves and respects me because I will sacrifice for her. She's more important than me. Do I really think and feel it all the time that she's more important than me? Heck no. I'm more important, smarter, and a man, and I deserve it. But I, it's not where I'm going. God wants me to go to sacrifice. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> so we're all in this together. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for your word. We give you the praise, the glory, the honor. Thank you, God, that we're going to walk out of here tonight with some great insight on what you would have for us. Now, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may it just drop into their hearts as part of their life and something they start to practice. And God will give you the praise, glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name. Let me just make sure everybody's all right with God. If you're in this place tonight and you're not right with God and you know it, you're still all caught up in yourself instead of God. Simple as this, is you gotta give God all of your heart. You gotta give God all of your life. That's what born again means. When Jesus, John, the third chapter, said this statement, you must be born again. He was making a statement that says you gotta give God all of your heart you got to give God all of your life. Someone said to me, what do I got to give it to him? If you want so, he'll just take it. He's not a thief. He's not a robber. He's not someone to talk you out of it or connive or to manipulate you. It's your life. It's your heart. And that's what he's all about. He came to this planet for you, gave you all of his heart, gave you all of his life, became the sacrifice for you. 
a beaten, bloody mess, walked to the streets, nailed to the cross, rose from the dead on the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father. Oh, thank God, you have a house who's not dead. The tomb is empty. But I'm here to tell you tonight, until you give God all of your heart and give God all of your life, you're not going to make it to heaven, nor will you ever be someone who will walk and live by the word of God. Your life will just keep going downhill, 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 worse and worse and worse until you become a failure. Totally and completely. You'll lose everything. But God will keep you in where you need to be. And it's time for you to be honest with yourself and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Being born again, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Now look, somebody needs to tell you. If I could do it for you, I would, but I can't. Not even Jesus can do it for you. This is your heart and your life, and you're the one that's going to make the choices on how it is going to exist on this planet until the day that he takes you home. It's your call. Are you going to take that and make the call for Jesus? Or are you going to keep it and make the call for yourself? And that's called giving God all of your heart and all of your life. We'll pray with you to do that. You need to receive Jesus. So I'm going to ask you tonight. I'm going to count to three. I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see you. You can put your hand right back down after I see it. Why do I want you to put your hand up put it right back down? You're making a statement of faith. You're saying, I want Jesus. I want to give him all of my heart. Give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence. Now I'll see your hand go up. Is that okay? And then you put it right back down. How simple is that? And we'll pray together. You can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then God's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And then you're going to have the power on the inside to do what God would have you to do. You'll start wanting more and more his ways instead of your ways. And it's a progression of getting rid of you and getting more of him. That's what this is all about. So tonight is your night. I'm going to count to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. Come on, be honest with yourself. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. Come on, be honest. Just because you're in church, you're not going to go to heaven. It's about your heart. It's always been and it's always about your heart. So if you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, maybe you prayed with Billy Graham or at a Harvest Crusade, that's great. But did you follow up the prayer with all of your heart and life? Or was it just a magical abracadabra formula that you repeated from somebody, but you never followed through with your heart? Don't treat God like he's stupid. Like you prayed that prayer and you think now that formula, that magical abracadabra formula will get you in heaven. And God is stupid in heaven. And he said, oh, they just prayed the right prayer. I'm going to, that's it. God watches your heart that follows your life. And so therefore, he watches your life that follows your heart. Therefore, he knows where you're really at. And tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight, I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. I'm going to sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see it. You can put it right back down. If you're embarrassed, oh well. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever, ever and ever. Today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm counting. Your time. Listen, don't miss this. You've missed a lot of opportunities. Get rid of yourself and get into God. Don't be selfish. Don't be something. Sacrifice yourself as he sacrificed for you. And give your heart and life to Jesus tonight, your night. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. God bless you. There's four. Thank you. There's five. Thank you. There's six back over here. Thank you. There's seven back here. God bless you. Eight, nine. Thank you. Anybody else? There's ten back over here. If that's okay, there's 11 right there. God bless you. There's another one back here. Twelve. Thank you for raising your hand. I got you guys already. You can put your hands down. Good for you. There's a dozen of you in here that are saying, I'm going for God. 
Anybody else need to say, I need to go for God? Raise your hand if you do. I'll just go right across the audience one more time. Don't miss this opportunity. This, this is how it starts. You can come in and hear the word of God. You'll never have the power to do the word of God if you don't get the power of the Holy Spirit. And it starts when you get saved. Real quick, anybody else? There's a, what, a dozen people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't miss this. Anybody else? Gosh, I feel like there's so many of you that need to get your hand up and you're not doing it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one. Thank you. 13. Okay. Why not? 14. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 14 of our people. Woo! Okay. All 14 of you. I want you to get a hold of you, a coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. All 14. You raise your hand. Mama, you, you let her raise her hand, you're going to have to bring her. And so I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Because I want you to know something. You're going to have to walk the aisle. It's a safe, friendly place for Jesus. Get out of yourself. Get your stuff. Get up here. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. My joy to honor you. And God good. Come on, come on, we'll wait for you. Come on home. Amazing love, how can it be? You might heal and die for me. They're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. Amazing love, I know true. So cool. Excited about you coming, you ought to be happy, put a smile on your face, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, it's not like you're going to die and go to the morgue, you get to go to heaven. That ought to make you happy. And so I want you to look to your left, see this guy smiling at you, his name is Pastor Joel, he's a good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise. He's going to do three things. Number one, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two is fun, now that you have Jesus in your heart, what does Jesus want you to do? He'll give you some free literature, absolutely free. Take it home and read about, what am I supposed to do next now that I'm a Christian? You know, most people just don't do anything. Then they fall back through the cracks. So this will tell you what to do. And then he'll introduce you to a program that we have that will help you get strong. Let us help you get strong. Today you're going forward with Jesus. Let us help you. You need someone you and share with you and show you and love you and tell you the truth about what God's word has to say. We're putting in our application to tell you and love you and to be your pastors so that we can guide you spiritually to Jesus in a great relationship with God so you don't go back, fall through the cracks, go do what you used to do, but you'll go on with God doing what God would have you to do. So make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.